Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Ryan and I'm a software engineer on the Firebase team working on Apple SDKs in our Waterloo, Canada office. And I'm Chen. I am a software engineer on the Firebase team also working on Apple SDKs. I'm based in Sunnyvale, California office. Firebase's mission is to help developers succeed by making it easy to build and operate apps. We know that the Firebase is a cross-platform mobile developer toolkit supporting iOS along with Android, Web, C++, and Unity. But hey, we know why you're here. If you're excited like me, you might find that the Apple ecosystem has made it easier to develop multi-platform apps, not just for iOS and iPadOS, but macOS, watchOS, tvOS, and Catalyst. Whew, that's a long list. At Firebase, we're looking into some of the use cases here and making them available across Apple's platforms. The Firebase SDK for Apple platforms give you the flexibility to unlock some non-iOS development flow, and we'll continue to do more in the future. Building and running apps for iOS and other Apple platforms has changed over the past few years. Swift has become the de facto language for building apps. We're going to cover some neat Swift language features and frameworks in this session. Swift UI, for example, allows us to build beautiful interfaces using a simple and concise syntax. Swift Package Manager makes it easier than ever to include Firebase SDKs in your project. Async Await and Combine are new ways we can reason about asynchronous programming. At Firebase, we're watching these changes closely, and today we'll show you how we're approaching these changes in the ecosystem. But first, Chen, what's going on in our GitHub repo? Let me tell you, Ryan. Since Firebase took the first step of open sourcing our client libraries in 2017, the vast majority of Firebase SDK for Apple platforms are available today on GitHub. We recently open sourced the Firebase Performance SDK at the end of 2020. So in case you haven't seen it yet, go check it out and let us know what you think. We're continuing to show our commitment of greater transparency and building a stronger developer community. To this day, we've closed over 2,000 issues and emerged over 5,000 pull requests. Our Firebase team loves the interaction with you on GitHub. We encourage you to voice your feedback, no matter their feature requests or bug issues, because you can talk directly to our engineers who build on the SDKs, including Ryan and me. It also makes the technical conversations much easier. We have been fortunate to have an amazing community of contributors. There are currently 139 of you contributing on Firebase SDK for Apple platforms. We're seeing active open source collaborations between the community members and Firebasers working together on combined support. We want to give you a big thank you to all of you for making our SDKs better. Being open source has made many things possible. Being able to step through the code and know exactly how your SDK behaves save hours of bug huntings. It also enables features like community support for tvOS, macOS, Catalyst, and watchOS. We recently added community watchOS support for real-time database and remote config. So now you can try this out in your watch app and use GitHub discussions to ask any questions. So many of you have already started using Swift Package Manager to manage dependencies. Today, Firebase is officially supporting Swift Package Manager. So in addition to CocoaPods, now you can use Swift Package Manager to add Firebase libraries to your app. Here, I'll quickly show you how you can do it, because it's really easy. First, you need to get the URLs from the Firebase iOS SDK repo page. Copy paste the URLs from the page. This should work for most libraries that are hosted on or distributed via GitHub. Now, open your app in your Xcode. Click on the File tab and select the Swift package. Then click on the Add Package Dependency. Paste the URLs and click Next. Select the version or branch you want to target. We recommend getting the latest version of our SDKs, not just for the new features, but more importantly, for bug fixes and improvements. Shortly after, you should be able to select the product you want to use here we'll use Analytics, Auth, and we want to try out the new Swift UI extension APIs. One thing to know is that if you want to add it in a different target, say you have an independent watch target, and you only want to install messaging inside the watch app, you can choose a target on the right side. When you're done, click and Finish, then you should be able to see the packages if you click Project and select Swift Package here. If you want to add more Firebase SDKs later, you can go to the target that you want to edit, Click on General and under the Frameworks, Libraries, and Embedded Content. You can manually add Firebase SDKs or delete some if you no longer need it. Now that we've created a new project with Swift Package Manager, 
Let's hear from Ryan to talk more about Swift and Swift UI. Thanks, Chen. Despite our SDKs being written mostly in Objective-C, we evaluate every single API to see how it gets imported into Swift and try to make the experience great. But what about things like result types, codable support, default parameters, or enums with associated types? We can't take advantage of those great Swift features when writing Objective-C. Sometimes we just need to write Swift code. That's why we've started shipping optional Swift extensions to different SDKs, and some have even been contributed by the community. Let's go over some highlights. We're going to be looking at a lot of code. Here's a snippet where we're downloading a picture from Firebase Storage using the traditional completion handler block. Both data and error are optional, and that leads to some awkward code causing us to force unwrap the error, not something we want to do if we can avoid it. The error should always be populated when data is nil, and data should always be nil when there's an error, but we can enforce that in the compiler using the existing code. By switching to use the function the new Swift extension provided, we can eliminate that awkward state and the force unwrap. Using a switch statement, we get the compiler safety of only having two states represented. We have data or we have an error. No more in-between states. Let's move on to Firestore and parsing data. This is a shortened code snippet showing data parsing from a previous version of our Firestore Quick Start app. After getting the data from Firestore, we want to convert it into a local type from the dictionary provided, in this case, a restaurant. Does this kind of code look familiar to you? Makes me sad every time I read the manual unwrapping and error upon string keys, not taking advantage of Swift's type safety features. It's fragile, hard to read, and easy to make mistakes when writing it. Instead, let's add codable conformance to our restaurant type. By conforming to the codable protocol, we get a lot of that manual code parsing for free, as it's generated by the compiler, and updates stay consistent across the type. Reading that data from Firestore is now as easy as calling the data as function on document snapshot and passing in the restaurant type. No more manually parsing that object. Codable does all the work for us. Setting the data in Firestore is just as easy, passing in the instance directly instead of a dictionary representation of it. We also just published a similar API for Firebase database thanks to an external contributor. Next, the new and exciting Swift UI. This one's my favorite. I'm excited to share we recently shipped some Swift UI specific APIs, with more to come. At WWDC 2020, we were introduced to a new Swift UI app lifecycle that's shared across platforms. Previously, we recommended you put Firebase app.configure at the top of your app did finish launching call in your app delegate. Well, where does it go if there's no app delegate? We simply override the init function that gets called when an app starts and call Firebase app.configure there. This remains true even if you need to use a UI application delegate adapter to handle things like push notifications, which we'll see later on in a demo from Chen. The first new API I wanted to show you is for logging manual screen view events in Google Analytics for Firebase. There are existing APIs to automatically record screen views and screen classes for UIKit, but due to the fact Swift UI does not have a corresponding UI view controller that we can tap into, that doesn't work when using Swift UI. Thankfully, Last year, we added a manual screen view event so you could have careful control over when these events were logged. And that fits in well when writing UIKit, integrating this into your view did appear, it stays mostly out of the way. Let's take a look at what this looks like in Swift UI. We can call these manual logging APIs whenever a view appears using the onAppear modifier. So this works, but it's pretty verbose and can clutter your code and take away from the structure of your view. We're at our limit with what we can offer from an API standpoint in Objective-C, but we can do better in Swift. This looks like a great opportunity for a custom view modifier, and that's exactly what we built. We can now mark up any view with the provided analytics screen view modifier to declare the name of the view, the class, or in this case, the struct, but we're matching existing analytics naming here, and any extra parameters you'd like to be logged when this view appears on screen. And thanks to Swift's default arguments, you can provide just the name and the rest is optional like in this case, where we're leaving out the extra parameters argument. We are really excited about this new way to mark up your views and record screen view events. Another Swift UI improvement we shipped is for building your own in-app message views. In this example, we're using the modal in-app message modifier. The closure is a view builder, and the arguments are the message which contains the data that was configured in the console, plus the delegate to notify the in-app messaging SDK of interactions like when a message is tapped or dismissed in order to record metrics and impressions. 
There are APIs covering each message type that make providing custom interfaces from your in-app messages easier than ever. Let us know in a GitHub discussion if you have any ideas for other SwiftUI helpers you'd like to see. The community is excited about Combine, and we can't blame them, we are too. We've received some amazing contributions from the folks in the community and have been working on some changes ourselves. There's still a lot of work to do in this space, but here's a sneak peek at what you can expect. This is the publisher we wrote for Auth's sign-in using an email and password. It returns a combined future of the Auth data result or the associated error. This is a bit simplified, but in this pipeline, we are extracting the user, replacing any errors with nil, and assigning it to our signed-in user property that gets represented in the UI. We've got multiple publishers across different SDKs to help you with your async data flow. You can keep an eye on progress in our combined APIs using the GitHub project we have set up. Combined isn't the only exciting progress made on async handling code. We're very close to seeing async await in a released version of the Swift toolchain. Let's take another look at sign in with email and password, this time comparing the completion handler to async await. Here, we use completion handlers to handle the control flow. Inside of that completion handler, we may want to do more asynchronous calls, which can lead to the classic pyramid of doom. How does async await transform this call? Instead of having to manage the state entirely in the completion handler block, it looks more like synchronous code and is easier to reason about. We can continue to do the same for other async calls, and it's going to be far simpler to maintain state and make sure errors are handled appropriately. Now, I'd like to pass it back to Chen for an exciting demo. Thanks, Ryan. Now let's talk a bit about how you can build an independent watch app with Firebase. Say you would like to track your daily coffee intakes on your watch. One cool thing about an independent watch app is that the users can use it without the need to sync from their phones. Firebase is working on making your watch app development easier by connecting your watch directly to Firebase cloud service. Currently, we have several products that have community support for watchOS, so that you can, for example, send push notifications from the Firebase console directly to your watch app, sync your coffee intake progress with our real-time database without a companion phone, or download the image from cloud storage directly to your watch. One thing to note is that the apps you set up on the console should be one-on-one -on -one matching of the apps in App Store Connect. If your app covers multiple platforms, use a single Firebase app and the Google service info playlist for all the platforms that the app runs on. This applies to iOS app extensions as well. For example, if your app has an iOS app, a Mac app, and a widget target, you can simply import the main app's Google service info playlist file to all targets. Now that you've set up your Firebase project successfully and then import the plist file to your Xcode, let's come back to how we can send push notifications directly to your watch app. We're using the latest Swift UI lifecycle here, so you will notice there's no extension delegate available. This is because a Swift UI lifecycle by default does not include any app or extension type delegate. What you can do here is to use WK extension delegate adapter to inject the delegate to your app where you can add code to request watchOS push notification permissions and handle any Firebase SDK's API that require an app delegate to exist. For this case, you will need to set an APN's token to messaging SDK. In the past, this step was handled automatically by messaging when Swizzling was enabled. However, as Swizzling has become more fragile, we no longer recommend this approach on watchOS. Instead, you will need to implement a did register for remote notifications method from the WK extension delegate to manually set the APN's token to messaging. The same applies to the iOS app if you use a Swift UI lifecycle. You need to use the UI application delegate adapter to inject your own app delegate from the UI kit. Then you can implement code that requires app delegate to exist. Now, let me show you a snippet of code on how you can download a cute sparkly image directly to your watch app. We're using the Firebase storage here. Oh. Did you notice the exact same code can run on your iOS app as well? Yes, because Firebase storage does not require a special watch key API like messaging, you can have almost identical code for your watchOS, iOS, tvOS, and macOS apps. We also unlock some app extension support because they're really helpful making it easier for your users to access your app and do more fun things. Take Widget as an example. Which extension is a great way of presenting your app information and making it more appealing for users to click on. Here's a code snippet where you can pull pictures using storage to your widget extension. And with that, you get a Sparky running on your widget kit as well. And it's a great way to show some key info of your app to the users instead of a basic icon, which is pretty cool. And that's it. 
We hope you had a great time building Apple Apps with us. Definitely check out our GitHub repo. There's a lot of useful information you can find there. Try it out, file bugs, and start GitHub discussions. We can't wait to see what you can build with Firebase.